So what we do with Greece is an, a number of uh, other events uh, starting uh, this month and this week actually on uh, this coming Saturday. Okay, uh, for those of you that uh, don't know me, uh, I'm Susan Andrews and uh, I've been involved with the Greek community for, I don't know, since, uh, <laughs> no, no, not since it started, since when we moved to the area, uh, I think back in the 80s uh, sometime, so, and currently I'm just involved with the uh, Greek school that I'm very passionate about. Uh, for those of you that know me know how passionate I am about uh, Greek school and just putting uh, events together as well. So I just wanted to make a few announcements. And first of all, thank you so much for coming out and being with us. Uh, so I'm just going to make a few announcements before I introduce our, our guest uh, to you. Okay, as you know, this past month has been Hellenic Heritage Month. Uh, and uh, we have displays up at the Oshawa Library and also the Whitby Library. It'll be there until the 31st of March, uh, when they'll be, come, they'll be coming down. Uh, go and see them because they're really interesting. Uh, part of the display are about Greek inventions from 2,000 years ago that are actually used today. Okay, my favorite is the vending machine. And also gives you a brief history of the uh, bouzouki as well, and we have some costumes. So they're pretty good displays. They're up until the 31st. And we're just honored that uh, the town of Whitby uh, has honored us for Hellenic Heritage Month uh, along with the city of Oshawa as well. But we have two special guests uh, that we're honored to uh, have with us uh, today. And uh, we'd like to... Uh, First of all, have uh, Mayor uh, Mitchell from uh, the town of Whitby come up and uh, say a few words. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, looks like it'll be a very interesting address. Uh, I was lucky enough many years ago, like 1974 when I was young, to spend a month in Greece traveling around. And uh, those were the days, I guess, it's different now, but you could just wander around the Parthenon or you know, a sort of early tourist period where nothing was blocked off. It was wonderful. And then about 10 years ago, uh, my wife and I had a long trip to Sicily, which, of course, as you would all know here, has actually more Greek architecture, historical Greek architecture, than they have in Greece. And, and that's, that's an amazing place to visit. So, so I guess I, I have a proclamation here that was mentioned, and it's... Uh, and I'll present it to you, and it reads that the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Whitby hereby proclaim March 2018 as Hellenic Heritage History Month in the Town of Whitby. So I'd like to present that to you. Uh, and, of course, you can't really talk about history, or certainly about democratic history, without talking about Hellenic history. And uh, um, I think we owe so much, and uh, I, I hate to say anything historical when we have a professor here about to speak, but... <laughs> But I'm, uh, I'm currently reading a book about Lincoln and his Gettysburg Address. So here's another historical factoid which you probably know about. But the famous Gettysburg Address, probably the greatest political address in Western history of my era or, or North American era, is founded on Pericles' oration um, in the first, uh, at Athens in the first year of the war with Sparta. So who knew that? And, and Lincoln was very steeped in, of course, Greek history. His house was in the Greek revival style, and the whole American culture of that very important democratic era was very much about explaining democracy, explaining American democracy by pointing at its antecedents in, in Greece. So very interesting and, and exciting, and, and I look forward to hearing your talk tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second guest has such a good time at Buzuki night to come back, so we're honored to have Tom Wall, a representative from uh, Selena Caesar Chavon's uh, MP of Whitby, uh, with us to say a few words. A member of Parliament for the Government of Canada, uh, Dr. Athanasios Gekas is a renowned scholar on the subject of Greek Canadian immigration, and it is only fitting uh, that he impart his wisdom as part of Hellenic uh, History Month. I'm pleased and proud to be here, and I uh, really thank you for your invitation. I'm really looking forward to learning a lot this evening. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Very pleased and very honored to have the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Professor Anathasios Gekas. He's the Associate uh, Professor of York University and also Hellenic Heritage Foundation Chair of Modern Greek History. He specializes in modern Greek and Mediterranean history. He's published a book called Xenocracy, State, uh, Class, and Colonization in the Ionian Islands, 1815 to 1864, which was published last year in 2017. He's also written a vast number of uh, journal articles, conference papers, and the list just goes on. And in 2017, he was awarded the uh, fellowship by the Greek uh, the Sporta Fellowship Program to work at the University of Crete, one of 21 selected from both Canada and the United States uh, to conduct an academic uh, project uh, in Crete. So we're very, very honored uh, to have Professor Gekas uh, with us. So with no further ado. Thank you all very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you all for being here, especially thanks to Susan and Peter for the invitation. Uh, but also thanks to our dignitaries uh, for being here. It's, uh, it's an honor for me. I don't get to speak that often to uh, public occasions. I have to give two or three public lectures. I really enjoy that. Uh, but it's always a challenge. Uh, how to uh, convey what we do uh, at university and research into a broader public. And uh, I think since I came here in 2010, uh, I had not done no research on Greek migration to Canada or Greek immigration history at all, uh, as far uh, as I was concerned. Uh, but I met uh, a former student, now former student of mine, Chris Grafos, with whom we started the Greek Canadian History Project. You can read about it in the sort of leaflet that you have on your uh, table. So what this was about was uh, Chris's and mine. Uh, concertingly effort to create an archive uh, for the history of Greeks in Canada and in Toronto to begin with. Because really, the, as Chris found out during, while doing his initial research, there was nothing really uh, about that. So this was still perhaps early days, but not that early. As I've been finding out since I started doing more res recent research on the history of Greek immigration to Canada before 1940. And now you've all a part of the Greek immigration to Canada, uh, or almost all of you who uh, came here in the 1950s and 60s. But while this is a big part of what we do, a research on uh, Greek immigration to Canada since the 50s and 60s, and up until the 1970s, early 70s, let's say, when immigration from Greece peaked, uh, what we are doing is collecting interviews and uh, historical material, photographs, uh, as well, uh, about, this, about your experience, about people's experience as immigrants to Canada. So let me know if you're interested, because we can uh, visit you, you know, get uh, an interview with your consent, obviously, uh, signed, uh, that if you are interested in telling your story, because that's what we're really interested in. And you have to think really down the road. It's not just for us or for our generation, let's say, but it's for your children and grandchildren and generations to come. Because this, at, after a certain point, uh, there will be no uh, immigrants uh, left uh, to tell their stories, directly, at least. And uh, as uh, Mrs. Andrews mentioned, uh, this is Greek Heritage Month. So what we do with Greece is an, a number of uh, other events, uh, starting uh, this month and this week, actually, on uh, this coming Saturday and Sunday. So there will be two uh, historical walks that will take place on March 24th and March 25th, in association with the Museum of Toronto, which is this organization that organizes events around the city. And uh, given that March is the birthday of the city of Toronto, they've uh, assigned this as a, as a month to have several uh, events. And our historical walk of the Danforth is one such major event. So you have to go online, you have to register for that. Uh, so just let me know by email or I can pass information to Ms. Andrews and she can tell you about it. But there, I think there are still spots available for both the March 24th and March 25th uh, historical walk. So you can go uh, for the parade as well. And there is one at 10.30 and there's another one at 2.30 on the day of the parade and the same the day before. And this is just one of the events that we're organizing in association with uh, the History Committee of the Hellenic Heritage Foundation. The other uh, sort of series of events are going to be another set of historical works 
or in downtown Toronto, where the anti-Greek riots of 1918 took place. And 2018 is, of course, 100 years anniversary of that. So we decided to commemorate this in any way that we could manage and we saw uh, fitting. The uh, culmination of which would be a week in uh, City Hall uh, exhibition in the, the first week of August, uh, where there's going to be a, a, a wealth of historical material, not just about the riots of 1918, but uh, about the history of the Greek experience in Toronto, let's say, the presence of Greek immigrants in Toronto, also, and of course, in association with their life, uh, lives in the city. And that leads me to what I'm going to mainly talk about today. And this is the attempt, as I said earlier, to introduce and to find out, for me uh, personally, first of all, what can we find out, what do we know about the history of Greeks in Canada before 1940? Because when I started teaching this history of Greek immigration to Canada course that I do at York, uh, I realized very quickly that this was kind of brushed aside after two, three pages. So, and then the Greeks came in sort of around 1900, and there were a few here and there, a few thousands there. And then they really, everyone who studied this, and they were really sociologists from the 70s and 80s and 90s, there hasn't been a ton of work on the history of Greeks in Canada in general. They were moving very quickly to the period of 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And understandably so. You know, this is when most people came to Canada from Greece, as well as a number of other countries. But what did we know about the history of Greeks before 1940? And the answer was very little. So, for example, uh, since we're talking about the uh, celebration of uh, Greek Heritage Month, this is not new. You know, in 1930, uh, as you can see at the top of the Toronto Daily Star newspaper, uh, Greeks were celebrating, and they were celebrated for celebrating their uh, commemorate the anniversary of liberation from, uh, of country from Turks, as the title say. Says uh, it was, they celebrated though uh, something different in 1930. They celebrated the 100th anniversary of liberation from 1830, which is really officially when Greece became independent. So actually, this was uh, how uh, the anniversary uh, started, celebrating uh, the beginnings of Greek independence. What we do celebrate in, uh, uh, on March 25th, however, is the outbreak of the Greek Revolution of 1821. Uh, and that, in itself, is, again, 2018 is an important date, because it was in, in 1838 that King Otto uh, of Greece decided, and with his uh, court, of course, with his government, that this was going to be uh, celebrated 25th of March uh, in 1838, it was going to be celebrated uh, on the 25th of March, every year, the anniversary of the Greek Revolution. Uh, and Greeks, uh, of course, in Greece, but also in the diaspora, started doing this uh, very quickly. You can see examples. You know, one is uh, one, the child that is uh, celebrated for he's born in Canada and he speaks English as well as Greek. You know, this is kind of announced with great joy, with as an achievement. And this is 1930. Uh, this, of course, has to do with what I will refer to later: the public presence of Greeks in the city. You know, how well, how and when Greeks begin to have a parade in the city to commemorate their events publicly. Um, something that you know, uh, the dignitaries here will, uh, I'm sure, associate with, because it means that there is an understanding and appreciation of the city of Greek presence or of any other presence of immigrants in the city. Now, where do uh, these early, these first Greek areas come from? I choose deliberately this map, this card ethnographic, ethnographic map, of Turkey in Europe, as it was called at the time, this is before 1912. This is before the Balkan Wars, when this area of uh, Macedonia and Thrace is divided between uh, Serbia, Bulgaria, and Greece. This is all Ottoman Empire, yet, still. So, uh, and you can see how uh, sort of uh, ethnically uh, pretty clear things are over here, in the sort of you know, south of uh, uh, the Mount Olympus, and how much more mixed picture ethnographically is uh, here, where you have uh, Greek Bulgarians, interesting definition, Greeks, uh, Macedonians, uh, Bulgarians, uh, Serbo, uh, Croatians, Romanians, and Albanians over there and the red. And this is a, just a sample of uh, the uh, complexity of the area where people came from. And very quickly, this is um, uh, 
this continued in uh, in areas other than uh, the the Balkans, where up until 1930 people came from areas of the Greek world, let's say in general, but they were not Greek citizens. This is uh, from the island of Castellorizo. Do you know where Castellorizo is? This is a tiny island between Rhodes and Cyprus. It's the further eastern point of Greek territory. And actually very contested by Turkey at the moment because of the seabed and the uh, argument that every populated area has this seabed uh, projection, which means that because of this tiny island between Rhodes and Cyprus, there is no um, open uh, to exploitation area for Turkey. So this uh, further eastern post of uh, uh, Greek territory, back in 1930, where this uh, lady came from, Eleni Parascheva, to Toronto, it was Italian. It was an Italian colony since the Italian-Ottoman War of 1911. And therefore, that's why she has an Italian passport. Now, this wouldn't necessarily register within uh, the uh, immigration from Greece, let's say, because it's not, technically. But that's uh, just an example of the thousands of people who came from uh, the area of Macedonia, uh, uh, here, uh, of uh, the Balkans in general, in general, and of Romania Minor, that wouldn't register as Greek immigrants. But what they do register is as Greek Orthodox immigrants. And the way to uh, find this is uh, by starting looking into a, a set of sources that I think are absolutely necessary and I was able to find the last couple of years to study, first of all, the numbers, the stories, the reasons for immigration, and how people settled uh, and fared in their new uh, adopted country, and what kind of relationship they kept with their uh, country of origin. So this is just a set of, of sources, newspapers, archives of Ontario, uh, of course, and uh, the census from 1921, which since 2014-15 is available in a very user-friendly way uh, that allows us to do uh, some of the things that I'm going to uh, show you about. Before the uh, work on the census that I'm going to show you about, this sample, this is what we knew about Greek immigration. This is where Greeks, uh, till 1950s, and then it increases gradually in 1961, 71. Uh, 61, 71, this is probably the period when most of you came here, right? It's, uh, this is when it peaked, yeah. So these people, however, are the initial founders, the founding fathers, to follow the reference from the US history that uh, the mayor uh, gave uh, earlier about uh, Lincoln. Uh, and they, they have important stories because they set the standards. I mean, what I'm gonna mention to you, some of the things you may know, some of you may not heard about because it's pretty old by now. We're talking about 100 plus years uh, from our time. But this is basically how, uh, and of course you can see how uh, few Greeks are compared to Italians, uh, for example, you know, a huge uh, population in Toronto and Canada uh, in general. But also much earlier immigrants uh, here. So there are some comparisons we can draw, but I think generally I'm very careful not to draw uh, and read too much into, you know, this is what the Italians did. This is what Greeks did. But there are similarities, for example, some that you would all recognize, I'm sure, in the uh, regional associations that uh, Greeks have. You know, here in Toronto, for instance, and Montreal still, there are village associations even. Well, the Italians do pretty much the same thing. Not in, uh, but especially from the south, uh, but they, they have uh, some similarities. But as I said, these, are, these were the numbers that we knew about until um, I started looking at the, at the census. And you can find out so much by a search. Basically, you go to ancestry.ca, uh, you pay if you're not affiliated with the university, and you search, let's say a criterion is, a search criterion is Greek, okay? You get 5,086 uh, records, individual records. So you see, this is, how, this is how handy it is, this is how wonderful it is. So you can see the name, the home, where they settled, year of birth, place of birth, relation with who they live with, and a set of other um, categories that uh, can be seen uh, here. Uh, and this is the first uh, person that comes up. You know, John Abbis, he was married, age 30, about 1891. He was born in Greece, his mother and father, Greece, very important for understanding where people come from. Uh, racial or tribal origin, this is how they classified people back then, racial nationality or tribe sometimes. And this is where he lived, Toronto East, 
district number one, ward one, sub-district number, this is how detailed it gets. And so you can put this in a map, as I'm trying to do, and find out even where, where people lived when they settled, as well as who they lived with. And most importantly, with about half of the people of these 5,000 numbers, you can tell what they do for a living. So now we'll be able to, hopefully, to find out uh, that Greeks didn't all just uh, open restaurants, didn't all just, you know, worked in uh, this or that uh, occupation, but they did a number of other uh, things as well. And you, why this is very handy is because until people from ancestry.ca turned this into a very user-friendly format, you had to read this, <laughs> which is unreadable, frankly. I don't know how they did it, but this is where John Abbey's. This is all the information. So people had to get the handwritten record to find out about every individual. Uh, and then they, they, they put it also on computer-friendly format. So now you have religion, uh, occupation, employment, and so on. But it's hardly readable. So we really have to rely on those people's transcription skills uh, and do what we can with it. So this is what we can do so far. I've, I'm going to show you, for the, in the interest of time, just a few of the graphs to tell you where uh, people live. So there were, uh, of those almost 5,000 people, that's one interesting thing, first of all. By 1921, 30% of the people who are Greek in Canada, they're born here. This is an already much more established community than we thought before. We thought, so people come here, stay for a few years, and then go by, we go back. No. By 1921, 30% of people are born here. So it's a very young population uh, as well. Predictably, most of them settled in Ontario and Quebec. You see up to 65 uh, of uh, percent, they are in Ontario, Quebec, and about 15% in British Columbia, as well as in other parts of... And they're very spread out in Ontario, too. I don't know about Quebec, but uh, definitely in Ontario. What kind of age uh, groups are we talking about? Um, this is uh, in 1921, okay? This is a snapshot. This is a census, basically of all who were recorded. Not of everyone who was here, but of those who were recorded. So there were as many married, uh, more uh, single, a few widowed, uh, widowed, and a total of uh, records. So you can see that a very high number is already married here. And have, uh, uh, and there, most of them are either uh, 26 to 30 years old, or very young, one to five years old. So this is the number of children basically, that are born in, in Canada by 1921. And uh, again, this is all in draft form, let's say, but you can see that most of them are laborers. This is the, this is the actual, I'm not embellishing anything, I'm just using the terms that they used in the census. So, uh, waiters, uh, cook, confectioner related, many confectioners, candy stores, uh, shoe sign on other related book, like a uh, storekeeper, uh, you can see there are, there's a number of um, uh, occupations, uh, uh, very few of them are um, restaurants, you know, this is the people are workers uh, here. Um, and very quickly, uh, just a couple of more graphs that I want to uh, tie you at 7.30 on a Sunday uh, evening. The age distribution again shows uh, that this is either a middle-aged population, these are the people who came, the sort of the three columns in the middle, and uh, on your left are the people who are born here. So you can see that uh, already by 1921, there's at least half of them uh, who are uh, born here. And this is the age of immigration, also very important. And what age did people immigrate to Canada? And again, they are in the mid-20s. 20s, but uh, very few also, some migrate in, uh, in their 40s as well, but not uh, many. And this is uh, by uh, gender as well, male as well as female. You can see that you know, in females, uh, for instance, emigrate also uh, very young at, uh, at the age of 18, 19, but also there are those who are born uh, here, who are uh, girls basically born here. Now, uh, some of the questions that I think are important to put this in a sort of historical context is uh, the gradual collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the factors that push these people to emigrate uh, from this. This is what's been happening. And this is what you can see in the sources, you know, from 1905, 1906. Uh, Greeks are classified and there are the same uh, sources that are used to describe what Greeks and Armenians are going through in the Ottoman Empire. So while we consider that this is kind of a sort of economic decision, 
these people, basically, these, many of those people are refugees. They are fleeing both from Asia Minor, where they are persecuted, or there is a threat of violence since the early 1900s, and it continues up until the Armenian Genocide in 1915-16, and up until the Greek massacres in uh, 1918, and of course the population exchange in 1922, which of course is not captured in the census because it's going to happen a year later. But they are refugees. That's what they are. And they are also refugees from Macedonia, the region of Macedonia in 1904 to 1908, when Greek and Bulgarian, mostly uh, armed groups, are fighting over the same territory. So there is an immigration uh, for that, especially in the period uh, the periods described uh, over there. Then I found some interesting documents about travel agents, who are also agents as in the sort of spies agents definitions, and they operate uh, here mostly, but especially in the regions of Castoria and Florina in northwest Greece, because that's where a large uh, Bulgarian Macedonian speaking population lives, who after 1912 are, are Greek citizens, of course, but still they are a target for uh, many of the Bulgarian uh, agents who are also uh, travel agents. So they make sure that people have the necessary papers to migrate to Canada or the United States, usually Canada. Uh, because until after, especially after 1924, you cannot enter the United States. It's becoming very, very difficult. The quotas are much lower and so on. So the other uh, interesting point I found is that in the 19... Okay, these are two different questions. I'll right. take them separately. The first one is, other than war and uh, the general uh, disturbances that there are in Macedonia between 1904 and 1912, at least, and in the wider region until 1922, you know, Greece is at war pretty much constantly between 1910, 1912, and 1922. And in fact, Greece's participation to World War I is what splits Greeks in Toronto, and probably in Montreal. In fact, is the, is the background of the accusation that Greeks in... Uh, the accusation by those veterans in Toronto who returned, you know, uh, maimed and in crowd crutches, they, they thought that Greeks were sort of slackers and they would not want to fight, which was not true. I mean, Greece entered the war belatedly in 1917, but it entered the war on the side of the British and uh, the French, and uh, therefore Canada. So other than this sort of general disturbance and misunderstanding of the place of people in the region, there were the economic reasons, of course. People, you know, Greece is generally a poor country until the 1960s, pretty much. Uh, constantly. It's a poor country since its uh, beginning, you know, since its independence. If I may interrupt, is I come from Sparta. Mm -hmm. Money, there was no industry where the northern area had later had more contact with the rest of Europe. Like some uh, parts of Greece that they were just stone. There was no chance of finding employment. That's what I'm trying to relate. No, you're right. You're right. There are people, and I'll uh, answer also the second question about the educational the level of education. The first Greeks who come to Canada, or the United States probably, in the 19th century, they are very well educated. They are very well educated. The first Greeks, you know, they, there is uh, Mr. Michaelis Muratidis, who is a kind of, you know, great uh, friend and a person to, who's been collecting uh, material about the history of Greeks in Canada and Toronto for decades. Uh, he has found even the grave of uh, uh, Dr. Peter Kostadinidis. Peter Kostadinidis came to Toronto in 1870. He was one of the first surgeons in the city. He was trained in medicine in Athens and London, and then he came to, to Canada. He's not very well known, in, I mean, he was an Anglican. He wasn't a Greek Orthodox. So he's not really part of the sort of Greek Orthodox standard narrative. Nevertheless, I mean, he was one of the first who came and they were very well educated. And people who are trying to um, immigrate to Canada. I've seen letters from people who are the sons of industrialists in Thessaloniki or in Constantinople, and who are saying in, in 1909, 1910, 1911, 1912, when things get really rocky in the region. And they are asking for information, for uh, uh, brochures about Canada. They're saying, well, you know, we're very well educated, we speak three languages, can we immigrate? And the answer is basically no, if you're not a farmer or if you're not uh, interested in working in a farm, 
uh, maybe you shouldn't think about it. So the, but then they say, the immigration officer is saying, well, but as long as you have the $250 that are required, which is very likely that they did, uh, then you can enter. So it gives them sort of the official line, but hints that they might be allowed to enter if they have the necessary amount. Uh, so there are people who want to immigrate, who are educated, who are clearly looking for a way out from a situation, from what they see in the Ottoman Empire, a situation that is becoming tense and probably untenable. But then many people immigrated here because they had um, hope, they were hoping for better chances uh, in their lives, for opportunities, which sometimes they could find in the United States, sometimes not. So this is, uh, these are sort of the standard reasons why people immigrate. Uh, but we can't really know that, you know, that's a problem, only, only indirectly or if you generalize. But what we can know, in fact, is what people do for a living when they arrive here. How much do they earn? Uh, who do they live with? Most, about three quarters of people in the census of the 4,800 people, they live in boarding houses with anything between 15 and 25 other people. Can you imagine that? Maybe you can, some of you. I mean, maybe when you immigrated here, you first stayed with four, five, six other people. Well, it was a lot worse back in 1910s and 1920s. People lived in, in boarding houses, uh, for a while at least. Not Mr. Letrus, the owner of the first one. He lived at Thorncliff uh, in, a, in a nice house, which was robbed actually once in 1940. So, so you know, the, the, the information you find out from these newspapers, which are now all online, this is the amazing. Good. You know, that's, this, this wouldn't be possible 10 years ago, probably. Now it's accessible online, and you can search by name, by place, by year, obviously by date. So you find a lot of interesting information, which I hope will give a much uh, fuller picture about the history of Greeks in Canada before the age of the mass migration, let's say, of the 50s and 60s. Uh, and also in comparison with other groups in the city. You know, how do, how do, how do they... Uh, and live uh, side by side with other groups in the city, whether Italians, Jews, Polish, uh, many people who arrive at the same time from other parts of Europe. In, uh, first of all, Greeks in Canada before 1940, anywhere in Canada, before 1940, before, 1940, before the 1940s, let's say, because that's when things change. That's when you know the war in Greece changed everything, the whole 1940s decade. So we have a different kind of immigration after 1950, as you very well know. Uh, but in terms of uh, collecting material, you know, sources for our archives at York, realistically we have to start with the Toronto area. You know, we've already got, as you can see from the collections, and there are a couple of collections that are not mentioned in that list because they're not official yet. But we have a collection of more than a thousand videotapes that I have no idea how we're going to deal with, but someone has donated them, and uh, hopefully another collection with, you know, boxes of newspapers, photographs, uh, booklets, um, you name it. So in terms of collecting sources for our archives at York, realistically we have to start in the area where, but in, in doing research, you know, you look at the census. The census is, you know, across Canada. It doesn't limit you to necessarily to one area. Um, like I was saying earlier, I was reading this uh, church book, the first actually, of St. George on Bond Street in 1937, and the people who are the executive is someone from Owen Sound. Does he even come to the meetings? <laughs> I don't know, this is 1936, maybe he is. Uh, so the, one has to think a little bit more broadly, I think, outside that, you know, Greeks in Toronto, Montreal, uh, and so on. But as it's always the case, it depends what questions you are asking. If the question is, you know, how many Greeks lived in Toronto, what did they do, and so on, you focus, you narrow your research in Toronto. If the, the question is more broad, what did Greeks do in Canada, how many were they uh, in, before in 1921, then you can uh, spread it more uh, even. Yeah, Wiki here says uh, 250,000 in, in the 2011 census. So I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, can you elaborate on the vetting process that took place for some of these early, I would say, 
And then, uh, do they face a lot of discrimination from other groups in Canada? That's difficult. I don't know about the second one. But but my guess, the only striking case we have about discrimination of Greeks in Canada is the 1918 anti-Greek riots. Which, you know, it's not a case of discrimination per se. There, there is some xenophobia behind it, obviously. There is this uh, sentiment of, you know, discontent, this, you know, grudge that veterans held for. It's also a very bad weekend for anyone who is not a veteran because it's the annual, the first annual National uh, Veterans Association Conference. So there's thousands of veterans, you know, in the city. Uh, but generally, I, I'm not sure they face the discrimination, not officially at least, uh, not recorded at least, which goes some way against the standard idea that, you know, Greeks were, um, and it's mentioned in a few works about the uh, early Greeks of Canada, that, that they were associated with uh, socialism or communism, and they were troublemakers. I think this applied more to Bulgarian, Macedonian immigrants not so much to uh, Greeks. Greeks tended to have a sort of lower <coughs> profile, uh, do their job, and as far as we know from now on. Um, what was the first question about... What was the vetting process for these uh, economic refugees? The vetting process seems from the documents of Immigration Canada that I've looked at, uh, the archives, seems to be strict, but as I said earlier, it allows people to enter if they have the $200 required. Um, but people did go, were told officially that they would have to go to work in a farm uh, uh, to, or uh, to be in a specific place for a given period of time. Uh, but then I don't know what happened at Halifax, where many of those people arrived, or when they tried to cross from uh, the border in, uh, with the States. Because that's how many entered in Canada. They came from New York initially, and then they crossed the border and came to Toronto. The Letros uh, brothers, I think, you know, they were in, uh, in the States first, like many Greek immigrants who entered uh, Canada. Uh, so I don't know how strict the vetting process was, but generally, Canadian authorities have quotas. And this applies until the 1940s. So in fact, uh, that's what I found from the Greek side of uh, the story, the Greek uh, documents of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There is a Greek official uh, who visits the Canadian ambassador in the 40s very often and says, can you increase the quota a little bit because we really need to send people to find a job. You know, this is during the war. This is during the Civil War. And then the Canada, Canadian authorities change the quota or they get rid of it entirely, sometimes in the early fif uh, 50s, when they start the program with domestic workers, with women to work in domestic work, with nurses, uh, targeting uh, individual uh, professions, let's say, in labor groups. Um, so at some point they get rid of the quotas altogether when they really open the country to immigration. So that's kind of roughly the... But the immigration policy is a very interesting part of the story, definitely. It doesn't look like there's a lot of... Based on the breakdown of your bar graphs there, doesn't look like there's a lot of family reunifications of bringing over elderly grandparents. I think, I think you're right. I don't think there is. In, if there is whatever family unification takes place, takes place here. I mean, there are reports that Greeks marry English girls. Uh, there is this guy, uh, what's his name, um, in uh, Vancouver, uh, George Vienna, who is apparently the, one of the first Greeks in Vancouver, who married a, uh, a First Nations girl. And he, he was uh, one of the first uh, people to do that, and kind of created you know, a sensation at the time. So there were uh, people who really settled, in the, but not, there's no uh, family unification, reunification as there is in the 50s and 60s. Well, generally, as you just said, uh, there were ways to not to avoid this, bypass. Uh, to bypass it. Uh, some other women, though, did work for at least a year in a, in a house that they were assigned to work. Usually no more than a year or uh, 18 months, I think, I believe. Uh, some could probably, like your sister, evade this altogether. Or people were uh, supposed to go to a farm and then they sort of stayed, whatever, they stayed in Montreal where they knew someone. Apparently, back then, back then meaning up until the 60s and 70s, you could do that. I don't know if authorities turned a blind eye or it was impossible to check where people live. This is before computers, obviously. 
So I don't know how uh, practically enforced it was. Which goes back to your comment about immigration policy, because it's all relative. I mean, it doesn't really matter what's on paper, as long as people decide to and can avoid it. You know, once they are here, and they did, many did. And they, you know, did well uh, with their lives, or they did whatever they could. Uh, but it does show that the state of Canada has a sort of overall planning. That's what it tells you. Whether people follow it, and some people did. I mean, we interviewed people in Winnipeg who came in the early 50s, and there was a guy who told me, you know, I had this W here. That's the only thing they gave me, this W. And I had to know, I, I knew I had to end up, they paid my ticket, and I had to get to the train uh, all the way to Winnipeg from Halifax. You know, that's, that's his, one of his uh, roadmap, <laughs> a W here, yeah, and, and he stuck with it, and he lived all his life, and he worked in a factory in Winnipeg. So people did stick to it, some people did stick to it. Uh, but domestic work was particular, you know, I don't imagine even those women who came from Greece to do domestic work, they imagined this was a career for their whole life. It was definitely probably a ticket to, to Canada. Uh, they were trained to do that in Greece for three to six months. They were paid for the training. Uh, part of their ticket was paid, I think. So, and I think altogether about 10 or 11,000 women from Greece came. This is, this is an entirely different story, you know, that... And we managed to interview some of those women who, who told us their stories. And uh, not all are pleasant. Some are, some are. They were really looked after by the people whose, whose house they worked, but some were abused, you know, verbally, if nothing else, and it was, it was hard. Uh, but that's after 1940, <laughs> so it's still uh, early stages, I think, for that. There's one or two stories that are kind of anecdotal about this Greek guy who uh, brought his... Um, uh, his love for a Greek girl from Greece to Canada, and uh, he tried to go after her, and he was shot by her brother also. Again, even in this story, women are very, you know, the woman is very passive, so it doesn't really figure into the story. So I, I haven't really found any uh, valuable information about women other than the very prominent one, for instance, um, the teacher. For instance, this one, uh, the, these, these we know a little bit about, but these are two or three, you know, women uh, of, uh, who came to, from Greece to Canada. Uh, but people generally want to be uh, Canadian from very early on, even when they, uh, especially when, during 1915-16, when Greece has not entered the war yet, the First World War, and there are uh, indications that the, the Greek king, because of his relations to the German uh, emperor, he was married to his sister, okay, uh, the Greek king. So he, he wanted to keep Greece neutral, for other reasons too, for reasons of sort of politics as well. And Venizelos wants uh, Greece to enter, the, the Greek prime minister wants Greece to enter the war on the side of the British and the French, and the Canadians by implication. There are Greeks who actually say, especially those from Asia Minor, that you know, we uh, are proud to be here in this country, in our adopted country, and that is why we do not want to associate with the Germans in any way, because the Germans are the enemy. So their identification with Canada happens, for the first time as far as I can tell, during the times of war. And th that's uh, not uh, surprising. This is when uh, identities and uh, uh, issues become very heated. You know, people have to take a position. Uh, they were interned, even as er er early as, uh, as recently as the uh, World War II. You know, the Japanese uh, were interned in British Columbia. So they, uh, they define themselves, I think one of the first times they define themselves as Canadian.